Welcome everyone to our webinar series. Um, today's webinar is actually quite special. Um, we've got um, Kerry from our Institute of Marine and Antarctic Studies who will be talking, talk, talking to you guys about our um, bachelor degree and master degrees within the Institute of Marine and Antarctic Studies. And we've also got Svenja, um, who is one of our PhD students who can talk more about her experience at the University of Tasmania within the Institute of Marine and Antarctic Studies. Um, I hope you guys enjoy the webinar today. It's going to be a fantastic one. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Kerry in a bit, but we do have um, some housekeeping rules. So there will be an open Q&A session towards the end of the webinar where I will be helping um, um, answering your questions live with the help of Kerry and Svenja. So Kerry, I will hand over the presentation to you and feel free to start. Thank you, Mona. So welcome everyone to the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies down here in Hobart, the bottom of Australia and the little island of Tasmania. Uh, it's not moving. <laughs> Mona, are you there? Yes, I'm here. There might be just a bit of a glitch. I'll just use there another method. Oh, I apologise oh, for that. I no apologise for that, everyone. Um, I'd like to just start by acknowledging country, which is the um, traditional lands of the Muna Muwanina people who have inhabited Tasmania for thousands of years and who to this day live and protect the Tasmanian environment. So I'd like to acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging before we start talking about the seminar today. So here at IMAS, the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies, we offer a degree, a bachelor's degree that is unique in Australia. It is the only bachelor's degree in marine and Antarctic studies that's available in this country. We also offer a master's degree in marine and Antarctic studies. And of course, we have a PhD program as well. So I'll talk you through some of these now. And then if you've got questions, you can ask us at the end. We'll be happy to try and answer them for you. So IMAS, a building you can see in front of you, has two different loca main locations. We're down here in Hobart, in this building here on, in the picture, on the wharf of Hobart. And we moved into this building in 2014. It was purpose built for IMAS and it's um, a very nice location because we are right on the water and we are about 15 minutes away from the main Hobart campus in Sandy Bay. So students can quite easily move between the two campuses if they need to. There's another campus of IMAS up in Launceston, which is in the north of Tasmania, and it has a campus out at Newnham. Along with that, we have a third location at a, in a little um, village town called Taruna, which is about 15 to 20 minutes away from this Hobart location, further south along the water. And that's where we have a very expansive experimental aquaculture facility, as well as where we house a lot of fisheries scientists as well. So all within Hobart, we actually have quite a few different facilities. And up in Launceston, along with IMAS, we have what's called the Australian Maritime College. So as a whole, Tasmania has a lot of marine facilities in a fairly small place that uh, students can, can um, get access to. So along with IMAS, there's the uh, Australian Antarctic Division. So that's the headquarters of a federal group. It's 
about 20 minutes south of Hobart in a town called Kingston. It's very accessible. We have CSIRO, which is our federal scientific organisation, and that's next door to this building that you can see in this picture. And this part of CSIRO is their marine research facility. So even within this area of Hobart, we have the largest concentration of marine scientists anywhere within the Southern Hemisphere. Hobart is also a gateway city to East Antarctica. And that means that we are the port where vessels leave from when they're traveling to Antarctica. And that includes, um, of course, our own vessels, Australian vessels, vessels from France, from China occasionally, and from Japan. So we are very active in the Antarctic. And along with our great new facility, we have a new program, the Australian Antarctic Program Partnership, which is made up of all these organisations, along with a few others, like our Bureau of Meteorology, that have all come together to work on Antarctic problems for about the next 10 years. It's federally funded from our federal government. And um, the idea is that we'll work together, all these organisations coming together to try and tackle some of those big Antarctic questions. We have a very large marine footprint or jurisdiction within Australia. Our um, economic, exclusive economic zone goes out to 200 nautical miles. We have um, territory in the sub-Antarctic, some of the islands, and we have a claim in, in, in East Antarctica as well. The, one of the interesting things scientifically about the area around here, East East Tasmania, East Australia, is we are in a known marine hotspot. So while the oceans are warming a lot throughout the world, they tend to be warming faster in some regions and the area off southern and eastern Australia is one of those regions. So we're really well placed to understand some of the impacts of uh, warming water and what that is doing on species that are living around our coastline. Uh, we're lucky enough to um, be home to several vessels for ocean going research. The first of these is the RV Investigator, and I'm sure Svenja would like to talk about that. She's done several trips on that as a student. And that's an oceanographic vessel owned by CSIRO, and it's our marine national facility. So it can be found anywhere within Australia at different times undertaking research for periods of six to eight weeks or sometimes shorter if, if necessary. We have an icebreaker currently, the Aurora Australis, which is its home birth is here in Hobart. It's actually parked out the front of this building at the moment. It um, belongs to um, a company that rents it out to the Australian Antarctic Division every summer for marine science and resupply in Antarctica. It's actually come to the end of its 30 year life and we're about to replace it with a bigger, newer icebreaker that will have state-of-the-art facilities. And we're expecting to see that early next year. And that's known as the Noina. So we're all very excited about this new opportunity. Along with those two big ocean going vessels, we have the Bluefin that's housed up in Launceston usually. And it's used a lot for student activities, including going out and learning about local fishery and coastal environments. And generally those trips would be a few days to maybe a week and in coastal waters. We're able to offer many practical field trips locally because the nice thing about Hobart is the marine environment is pretty much at our front door and Launceston's the same. So it's quite easy to get out into the environment. We have industry connections uh, aquaculture is one of our biggest industries in Tasmania and fisheries is also quite important, particularly for uh, rock lobster and abalone. Along with all these general labs, we have a couple of globally recognised facilities that are very specialist. One of those is the Experimental Aquaculture Facility down at, in um, Taruna. It's really been developed to look at Atlantic salmon, because we have the big salmon aquaculture here, but other species are also included. There's a rock lobster facility down at Taruna, um, and we also have other fisheries down there as well. 
And within this building here in the waterfront, we have an ice core lab, which is dedicated to being able to take million year or 800,000 year ice cores and, and chop them up to learn about climate change over very long periods. So in terms of our facilities, we have a lot on offer. And this building itself is housing most of the um, teaching, the undergraduate teaching occurs in this building or up in Launceston. Uh, Taruna doesn't have a lot of undergraduate teaching, but it does have many facilities for um, honours, masters and PhD students. Okay, so we offer a Marine and Antarctic Science Bachelor's degree which I said is the only one like it within Australia. And it's really because we are so close and have such a strong connection to Antarctica that has enabled us to be able to offer this particular degree. It's a minimum of three years. Students can undertake different specialisations and depending on the specialisation they'd like to take, they would be based in either Hobart or Launceston. So the specialisations that are currently available in Hobart include marine biology, physical oceanography, and marine and Antarctic governance. So that's more about the policy and the law and the management of Antarctica. Then up in Launceston, there's a sustainable aquaculture and marine resource management. The way we organise the three years is students will normally do four units per semester and two semesters per year, which gives them a total of 24 units over first, second and third year. There's opportunities where they can do a major, a double major, particular, um, especially if they're interested in a couple of different specialisations, they can major in both. They can also undertake a minor in um, related subjects like chemistry or geographical in information systems or geology, something along those lines. And then there's also space in their study plans for some elective studies as well, where they can pick up something related or just do something else that really interests them. Okay, so after they've done their three years, we have an honours year available for students who are generally achieving a credit average or above. And an honours year is really based around giving students practical experience in research. So what they'll do there is they'll be paired up with a supervisor or a small team of supervisors, and they'll work directly in that project team and undertake research. Now that can be field-based, it can be lab, it can be a combination, or it may be that it's um, really data-based and they do a lot of modelling, for example. So it's really broad and is very much designed to cater for the interests of the students as they start to develop into their fourth year. So this is a very traditional pathway in Australia for going on to a PhD. But we also, and I'll talk about that in a moment, we do have a master's program as well. So students will often do that extra year because it gives them the extra um, suite of skills where they've really been able to focus and learn how to do research, which is, as you can imagine, quite important in any of the sciences. Um, projects can really vary. Here they're learning how to measure abalone shells. It could be modelling the Southern Ocean. It could be looking at weather patterns. It could be testing out new advances in um, aquaculture. It can be learning about how zooplankton work in the ocean and some of the effects of climate change. A really broad range of topics. And each year, those topics will be posted on our website so that students learn firstly about the things that are available, um, what the skills are that they will learn, who's running the project, and just generally gives them some background so they can start to narrow down their decisions and start to focus more on their interests. And of course, students' interests change usually over their first three years, and they'll often end up in areas where they weren't really expecting to be when they first started at university.
Okay, as I said, we have the honours year, which is one year, and that can often lead to an articulation into a PhD program. But we also offer a master's event of marine and Antarctic science. This is a minimum of two years. Again, it can be undertaken in Hobart or Launceston. And the specialisations are slightly different. We still have them in marine biology and governance and policy in Hobart. And up in Launceston, they have a third one, along with fisheries management and the sustainable aquaculture. They also have seafood science available. And that's quite a popular specialisation in that area. So again, this is a very unique degree that's being offered here by combining um, both the marine environment, the, the local marine environment, and then opportunities to undertake Southern Ocean work as well. So this works um, as a master's by research slash coursework. And the first year is the students undertaking eight coursework units. There are two core units in there and then six elective units that they can choose to do. Most of these units are offered as short intensive two week blocks. So they'll do nothing else for that two weeks except for that particular unit. And they're spread throughout the year. So in between those units, sometimes students will take on um, opportunities to work in a lab, just start to get experience with some of the researchers or they may be doing other things outside of, of their actual coursework as well. So after that first year of coursework, they then will do a one year thesis. So similar then to the honours degree, and that will be on a project of their interest. So what happens there is they find a supervisor in a project, they do the work through the year, and by the end of the year, they're expected to have written a manuscript that could, if, um, if it's suitable, be sent out for publication. So it's generally not done by thesis, it's done by manuscript. And the uh, honours year, they have a basic um, choice between doing a traditional thesis or doing this similar approach to the masters where they'll write up a manuscript that they get ready for publication. Um, so why would students choose one pathway over the other? It's quite individual. Some students know that they just want that extra year of research, and that can often be students who are quite interested in getting into a PhD straight away. So they just want that fast articulation. The masters can also articulate to a PhD, but often the students choosing that are more interested in, in broadening their skill set first. So they want to do these extra intensive units that I talked about that are in blocks, short blocks, where they can really grow their skills in quite a few more fields before they then go on and do their thesis. So they're equally attractive, um, but to, often to different students, depending on what those students' needs are and what those students' plans are. Okay, so this is um, the RV Investigator, as it says. It's the Marine National Facility. It's housed um, at the wharf here next to CSIRO. So we see it a lot coming and going. And we do have some opportunities for students to take part in short voyages. Sometimes we have the boat has to move between one port and another port for the scientific needs and often in that um, that transit time while it's sailing from one area to another students can go on board at times to do short uh, projects and get some sea going experience alternatively some students will get to go um, down into the southern ocean by volunteering on the investigator or on the aurora australis on our icebreaker so there's certainly opportunities for ocean going work, but we also have a lot of opportunities for more local um, ex field experience. So getting out in the field for part of the undergraduate degree, some of our trips over to Mariah Island, which is a, an island up on the east coast of Tasmania. We run field trips that are about one week long. And uh, the lovely thing about this island is it has marine habitats that are in close proximity. 
So we've got rock pools, we've got estuaries, we've got sandy beaches. Um, students can join a diving, a scuba diving project, working on seagrasses. They can work out of boats collecting plankton. There's lots of opportunities to get their hands on and start to learn some of those skills. So there's a few projects, a few subjects that um, have field trips to Mariah Island. We also have trips for the birds and mammals of the Southern Ocean. That's on Bruni Island, which is an island just south of Hobart. And students in that can go, they go out and learn how, how to handle birds, how to monitor penguins. We have a, the little fairy penguin is found around Tasmania, so they can work with that. They can work with seabirds. They can learn how to observe seals and whales while at sea. Up in the north, we have fisheries management courses, and they go out on the bluefin for a few days and get hands-on experience with fisheries. They can work on oceanography up in Launceston as well, learning about responsible fishing. And along with all those things, we can often provide students with opportunities to work as interns with some of our aquaculture facilities, because students are always looking to get that work experience. And up in the north in particular with aquaculture, they really aim to get all the students involved with some intern program with one of the fish farms. Okay, so currently um, UTAS is ranked fourth in the world for marine and freshwater biology and seventh in the world for fisheries and oceanography. So although we've been an institute for only um, a few short years, six or seven years now, our rankings in the world have increased over that time and we do really have um, some good international reputation here now and a lot of interaction between the researchers within our institute and researchers from many parts of the world. So we're particularly strong in marine research, oceanography, fisheries, climate research is a particular strength as well. Environmental conservation is a very big thing in Tasmania. Governance and of course, management and policy. And if you can think about things like fish farms that are dotted around the, the coastline, then the state government is very keen to, to see those managed effectively and sustainably. And so our IMAS students often get involved in that type of work once they've finished their degree. So some of the career outcomes and some of the students that have gone on to other jobs include certainly working at the Antarctic Division as a researcher, um, coastal community engagement. We've got a big program here, the Derwent Estuary Program that looks after the estuary that Hobart is part of and also up on the uh, in Launceston there's the Tamar River. We need to manage those because there's a lot of people living around those areas and we want to keep them as in good condition for as long as we possibly can. Marine park management, we have um, state government has a marine park section and our students have ended up there. Uh, fisheries biologists, also fisheries observers, where students will get opportunities to go on seagoing vessels and observe the catch. That's required in a lot of Australian fisheries. Um, commercial diving. And one of the interesting units that students can do here as an elective is a scientific diving course. So they'll get their scuba diving uh, qualification, but along with that, they'll get skills in actually being able to take scientific research underwater. And that's a very popular unit with a lot of students. Fish health is important here, and particularly in the aquaculture space, conservation, um, federal or state government advisors. So we have programs where students can end up um, as interns through the government pathways. Less, um, less common might be things like ice core chemists, certainly collecting ice cores from Antarctica and using them to look at past climates is a, is a big thing down here. Climatologists, the Bureau of Meteorology, our federal meteorology organisation is keen to 
um, understand the climate both in the Southern Ocean and around Australia and be able to predict things like droughts, floods and all the other environmental things that seem to affect Australia at different times of the years. Um, and then of course, if students are really interested, they may find they go down a more classical academic pathway where they become researchers or university lecturers. Um, now, the University of Tasmania does offer some scholarships for international students. And the biggest one of these is the Tasmanian International Scholarship, which provides commencing international students with a 25% reduction in their tuition fees. And they can have this for the duration of their degree, as long as they maintain a satisfactory um, outcomes of their grades each semester. Uh, the TIS is available for most undergraduate and postgraduate courses. And we also offer them for the Foundation Studies Program. Now the Foundation Studies Program is designed to give students, new students, a few skills if they don't quite have the skills they need to start in the bachelor's degree. So an example might be a student who didn't study chemistry at high school or in the later years of high school may need to do a foundations program in chemistry to get them ready for their bachelor's course. And that usually occurs, those sort of courses will occur in the summer prior to when the students would start their first year um, undergraduate course. So that's the foundation studies program and it's quite effective in getting students ready for university study if they're feeling they're a bit lacking in some of the research, the subject areas. Okay, well, that's all I'd like to say at the moment. So I'd like now to introduce you to Svenja Halfter. She's a PhD student here. She has um, come to us from Germany. Svenja is a student working in the Southern Ocean. So she spent a lot of time on research voyages and she's now been here for about three years. So I'll turn you over to Svenja. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Uh, well, they have, I said everything now, so I <laughs> don't have to say anything. <laughs> um, so uh, as Gary already said, I'm a PhD student here, actually working with Kerry and another supervisor. And I study uh, zooplankton, so small animals in the Southern Ocean, and how they are related, uh, well, how they're, um, they're and their role basically in um, the oceanic carbon cycle. Um, so how they, how they help us fighting against climate change basically. And I started my bachelor's in Germany studying biological sciences and um, added then with a master uh, because in Germany you can't do an honors. So I had to do a master's, which wasn't a bad thing um, because it was a year of coursework and then I decided um, to move to the Arctic. Um, so I worked, uh, worked, like studied in the Arctic and worked a bit as well for my master thesis, my master project. And, and after that, I saw this job description here um, because for a PhD project, it's like you apply for a job. Um, and well, well, they picked me, I don't know why, but <laughs> um, that's why I moved down to Tasmania and you know, switched from the Arctic uh, to Antarctic studies. And now I'm here two and a half years uh, in Hobart, which is a really nice um, city for me, I guess, because it's a nice size and everything. And I really like uh, working at IMS. Um, so I think it's, uh, there's a difference between a PhD and master's or honors is that you get paid for a PhD. So it's a scholarship and a fee waiver. So I actually don't have to pay fees if I don't go over a certain deadline of the four years. I think I have to start paying, but we hope we don't. Um, Get there, so <laughs> I will finish before. Um, and yeah, as I already mentioned, in the last two and a half years, I um, got to go on uh, many voyages. On I think on three or four on the Investigator, the Australian research vessel, just docked outside here, and two on with the Japanese, um, the RV Umitaka Maru. One was around Japan, and one was around um, well, from uh, Fremantle, Western Australia, to the Antarctic, um, like. East Antarctic and then back to Hobart. So all around us in the ocean. It's really nice experience. Um, 
and on these voyages we usually take also some students to help us so if you start here with like uh, honors or masters there's opportunities to join us and help us with our research and maybe um, do your own research as well um what else i think in hobart i think really like imus the location i mean itself is really amazing it's so close to the waters already mentioned uh, last week, for example, for lunch, we saw dolphins in, in the harbor and we see seals and it's it's a beautiful environment. Um, it's really nice here as well because there are lots of international students like me. So um, we're like a little family and <laughs> it's nice when your family is really far away. So you can uh, have a P own PhD uh, family here. It's really nice environment. Um, and Howard itself, it's really close to the bush. So if you like, if you're into hiking or water sports or anything, outside it's super close so um i can really I can recommend this it's um, yeah it's beautiful i love it <laughs> we're really looking forward to maybe i start a postdoc here and uh well next year when i finish my phd so i really hope i could stay a bit longer um yeah if there are any questions about well student experience i guess or other um requirements then just yeah email me or yeah ask now Okay, so I think we're having the questions uh, at the end. So thank you, Svenja, and thank you to everyone. Here is information on the course if you need to find out more. And of course, online at the University of Tasmania, we have a lot of general information for students, um, particularly for new students, for international students, for continuing students, it's all there. And it gives a lot of good information, not just about the courses, but about living down in Hobart or in Launceston and, and what students could expect. So thank you again. And if you have any questions, we're happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Kerry and Svenja. That was a fantastic presentation. It was really good to um, see such a comprehensive presentation about the two degrees and Svenja it was really good to hear your experience um, especially from a PhD perspective. Um, apologies if there's any lags from my end I've just been having some connection issues but we have had one student um, or yeah someone send a send a question through. Um, so the question is um, Kerry maybe you can answer this one. Uh, they would like to know students who graduate from the bachelor um, or master's degree, uh, is there a lot of opportunities for them to get jobs? And I guess that was, that's usually one of the more popular sort of questions we get in terms of um, job opportunities and demands after students graduate. Yes, and I think that's, that's very understandable that students would like to know that. Yes, I think it's fair to say that students at the University of Tasmania on a whole do have a fairly good employment rate um, up to one or two years post their degree. Now, of course, that will vary a lot, but many students do end up working in the field. And I've certainly known a lot who have ended up, it might take a little bit of time. I wouldn't, I wouldn't wanna lie to you about that. I think that's the world today, but definitely students um, end up in working in the marine field in many cases, and that can be anywhere from being on the aquaculture side of things, looking after fish health, all the way to working in climate science. And somewhere like CSIRO often employs our graduates, usually though graduates with a PhD. Uh, students with bachelor's degrees have definitely ended up in um, state government, in the university itself or other universities working as technicians and technical officers. So I think there are a lot of opportunities. What we find is that students have to be prepared to um, move away. If you know, Hobart is a small place and there are jobs here, but you need to look more broadly. So students might end up in Western Australia is quite common in their fisheries. Uh, New South Wales, Melbourne for consulting firms, and of course, internationally. So the jobs are there. 
but like many jobs these days and particularly in this new climate that we live in you have to be prepared to maybe move around a bit before you hit on the job that might be the one that you have for a long time. Thanks Gary, it's really good to set the expectation I guess for students um, to make them aware that it does involve a bit of moving around. We do have a couple of other questions coming through. Um, they're both kind of similar questions but the question is for master's students what is the process of finding a supervisor is it based on funding or space in their lab and the other question was around the same so can UTAS assist PhD students to find the supervisor uh, the short answer is yes to both of those um, so the IMAS website actually has dedicated web pages for projects that are suitable for the honours and master's level and then projects that are suitable for the PhD level. And they are separated into those two categories. They're easy to search. There's a search function. So for example, if you wanted to just focus on oceanography or you wanted to focus on aquaculture, you could put in those search functions that would help you narrow down your search. Each one of those will have a description of the project along with the supervisors who will be leading the project, a um, bit of background and then the skills that they might be looking for from the student but also importantly the skills that the students will gain from doing the project. So I think that's the, the first part of the answer. The second is in terms of finding them, yes you can look online but also if you're here doing um, say in your first year of a master's where you're doing your online coursework then you get to know quite a few of the lecturers and you can start to have conversations with them about your particular interests. And sometimes it's just a matter of talking to different people and getting a feeling for what's available and what you would like to do. And usually it can take again a little while, but you'll find a supervisor that will fit with you. If you find a project that's on offer, you can, um, be fairly assured that the funding is there for the project. For our PhD students, of course, you can apply for a scholarship, which is, um, sorry, that's all online. So all the process for undertaking a PhD or a master's project is online for how stu international students need to apply. And I'd certainly encourage you to go there at the first case. And then, of course, if you have specific questions, get in touch with someone. And there are names on those websites of people that you can contact directly. Yeah, I might add on. If wanna, sorry, if you want to develop uh, your own project, I think it's useful when you find people online, just send them an email there, you know, you know maybe take a while to answer. But then we send them emails. Um, um, if you want to develop something, I think they are almost usually open. Of course, for the project, they're already advertised, as Carrie said, there's usually money for this, like the rich funding for this, uh, for stuff you develop yourself. Of course, it's not like clear in the beginning, but you can figure it out, I guess, with together with a potential supervisor. So people are usually open here for collaboration. So get in contact with any, if you're looking at the project pages and you see a project that interests you, I would suggest one of the first things that you can do is write to the project team, usually the first named person, the, the main supervisor, and just start some discussion with them. Fantastic. Thank you both so much. I think that was really clear answer. So hopefully that's answered um, some of the people's questions. So we've got um, another question where um, Yi Ray is asking, um, on the Bachelor of Marine website, it says if you choose the sustainable aquaculture specialization, you will engage directly with industry through a work placement unit. Is this assisted by UTAS? Will it be during the semester? Um, it's definitely assisted by UTAS. I fairly sure it's during the semester. I have to admit that um, I don't work in the aquaculture space, so it's, I'm a little bit out of the loop there. But I know that uh, UTAS assists with the placements and it is part of what they do for the aquaculture degree. So it's very well organised and structured. And I think in most cases it would be part 
of uh, during the semester. But I guess there could be opportunities to have longer periods, that, for example, over the summer break. But you would not be expected to do that all alone in terms of finding that opportunity. That would be, you would get help in, in that. Definitely. Um, the other question I have here is, with a bachelor or marine program, how much of the studies is taken outside of the classroom? Is it 50% or more? Um, it really depends on the unit. Most of the units are inside, but as I pointed out, there are a few units that do have a very strong component of fieldwork. And most of that field work is based around um, getting out and doing, like I can speak quite um, easily about marine ecology because that's a unit I'm involved with. And we take students out for six days to undertake a project, one project over that time in a small group. And a small group would be anywhere from four to six students. And that project forms the basis for much of what they do when they're back in the laboratory because once you come back to um, IMAS, you're, you're working on all of the data that you collected while you're in the field and you're presenting it in a seminar with the rest of your group, as well as writing a major report based on that work as well. So in terms of your assessment, that field trip is worth about 40% of the whole assessment and it's a significant component. It's a compulsory component of that unit um, other units really vary. Sometimes you might be out just for day trips or things like birds and mammals. Again, you could be out for a week working on the, on the top predators. So it's very unit um, dependent, but I think it would be fair to say that in your first year, you don't do much in the way of field work. And second year on, you start to get a lot more hands-on in the field and in the laboratory. Thank you, Kerry. Um, another person is asking, or student is asking, um, if we could, if you could explain more about the ice core chemist, I guess, as a career outcome, or what well, that more, what does okay. that mean? <laughs> <laughs> so basically, in Antarctica, if you're aware, it's covered with a polar ice cap that's up to four kilometers thick in places. And depending where you are in Antarctica, that ice cap may not have moved much. So there's not much, because um, if you think about water moving, okay, now we've frozen that water and it's a region where there's no, say, glacial activity or the ice is just not being dragged around and moving out to the coast. So effectively what that means is that 4,000, um, meters of ice is pretty much a record of what's happened over time as that ice has grown and been laid down. So you take a core through that ice and you can really look at time, what's happened over time. And some of these techniques involve chemistry. So various methods, you might look at oxygen isotopes, which are useful for looking at past temperatures, um, what else do they measure? Various aerosols, you can pick up things like volcanic activity in the ice cores, depending on what you measure. Uh, Sulphur is a big one to measure. So there's just various ways that you cut up that ice core and then process those, those pieces um, for, for whatever it is you're interested in looking at. And then at the same time, you know how old that ice is because it's laid down and it hasn't been moving and you can start to build up a climate record over, well, the, the big aim for the Antarctic division over the next few years is to get an ice core that is over 1 million years old at, the, at its basal in the bottom part. I hope that's, that helps us explain. That's that, amazing, that Terry. That was fascinating. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Um, just moving on from a different question I had. Um, in terms of professional um, recognition, are there any sort of professional organisations students can be a member of as part of IMAS when they complete their degree? Uh, yes, there are. Svenja, would you like to take that one? I know you've you've been involved with a few. Um, you mean like Rescom and Boats? 
Uh, no, I think more like AMSA and um, Apex and. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. true. Um, so as an early career researcher, also as an undergrad, actually, like as a bachelor or master student, um, uh, you could join APEX, which is the Association of Polar Early Career Scientists, which is just a network of early career researchers and with a goal of net networking, um, yeah, just connecting different ECRs. They, um, they organize some events, sometimes like webinars, mainly because we have members of all the world. Um, and I think it's, it's for free to join anyway. So um, I think you can just join and like this, like stuff going on. Um, and just nice to be part of like a polar or a career community. And other um, organizations are like EMSA, it's the Australian Marine Sciences. <laughs> Marine Sciences, thanks. <laughs> Association. Oh, yeah, yeah, here we go. <laughs> All these acronyms. Um, it's uh, also again, um, I think it, it's a bit of a membership fee, but it's not too much and it's it's really worth it. I, there you do usually do a once a year conference where you can go to as an ECR and like post the prizes or also like just get up to date with their current research, current marine research in Australia. And yeah, that's also a really nice uh, thing to join. And there are different networks you could join even as an undergrad. So there are no limits. You don't have to wait until you finish with your studies, actually. So I think the AMSA um, subscription for students each year, it's it's probably around $40 or so. Yeah, it's not and too then much. The mm. conferences are held in different cities with it around Australia each year. Uh, of course, this year it was um, was cancelled. It was meant to be in South Australia, but... Um, Normally, it's every year, and we've had them in Hobart. Um, last year was in Perth, in Fremantle. I went across to, they've been up in Darwin. We try to take in the whole of the country, and every few years we share it with the New Zealand Marine Sciences Association, and we do a joint conference. So they're just a couple. There are many more, and many mm -hmm. that are more um, specific. So there's the Ecological Society of Australia, there's the, um, the fisheries biologist group, there's the climate group. So depending on where your interests were, there's certainly a lot of more um, targeted groups as well that you can be part of as, as a student right from the start. Mm -hmm. And many of these offer um, prizes, as Svenja said, if you go and present your work, or sometimes they'll offer um, financial assistance so that you can attend the conference as well. That's amazing. And that's great to know that there are different types of um, institutions or organisations students can join. Um, amazing. So, Svenja, I had a question for you. So, do you have any sort of advice for, stu uh, for students um, who want to join UTAS to either do their bachelor or marine or PhD? Any sort of advice you wanted to give to students coming to UTAS? I know you spoke a little bit about your experience, but anything in particular about IMS that you would um, apart from it being world renowned, uh, like particularly recommend for students to join if they have an interest in this area? Sure. Um, I think IMAS is a really uh, nice place because it's, it's relatively small, but there are so many um, the different people doing different things and you can learn so much just like walking around the um, walk around here, talking to different people doing lunch break. It's, it's yeah, it's you learn so much. Um, we have like a student run society which called boats bottom of the earth society and usually they would do um once a month like a social get together so like after work just um you know a couple of beers or non-alcoholic drinks if you don't drink alcohol um just talking to different people i think it, yeah it's really makes it really um like nicer to be here. it's not just work it's also your life or most of your life happening here so it's yeah that's a really nice thing um, I think to our students want to start here, like um, try to find a mentor, find good people supporting you um, and your research or your your um, your studies. I guess like talking to like potential supervisor as early as possible, so and figure out what you're actually interested in. Like try out different things, develop your skill set you want to like, interesting, like your things you're interested in, and then. Um, talk to like potential supervisors for thesis and projects as early as possible. 
Amazing. Thank you so much, Sunya. Um, Kerry, I had a question, um, but before I ask the question, I'm just reminding the audience that if, um, please send through any sort of specific questions you guys have before we close off the webinar soon. Um, so just pop in through your questions in the chat box and we can answer them live. Um, Kerry, I, I, I just wanted to ask, uh, and I've just lost my <laughs> train of thought, um, but in terms of, oh, there you go, in terms of industry links, um, sort of two parts of the question, what sort of um, industry links does IMAS have internationally or nationally? And also in terms of um, the, our graduates that have graduated either from masters or bachelors or PhD, have they gone back to third countries or internationally and found jobs? Or are you are you are are you currently in touch with them at all? Um, yes, in some instances, I've got um, past students who have gone back to uh, Malaysia and China and are working in the marine field. Certainly, um, a lot of students who have come through the Taruna Labs in the aquaculture and fisheries space have gone back home and are working in large aquaculture industries and or fisheries and particularly in some parts of Southeast Asia there have been students who have gone gone home and got jobs there um, what was the other part of the question <laughs> sorry <laughs> other part was about industry links nationally yes, or internationally yes so um, we have industry links in different parts of the world and we're building more so a recent example would be a delegation from IMAS went to Indonesia to form links specifically with their fisheries and aquaculture over there. And there's that's starting to be built now and that will develop over time where the people from here are um, setting up to have exchanges with researchers and students to come even to IMAS for shorter periods, but to get opportunities going both ways. We have, we certainly have a lot of links with our local marine industries, as you can imagine. Um, but anywhere in the world, particularly where there's a lot of aquaculture, uh, Chile is another place where we have quite a few links with the aquaculture industry. Um, and where else? I'm just trying to think. So definitely Chile, Indonesia, parts of Malaysia. So yes, quite a few countries that are doing a similar styles of aquaculture, we have very, very strong connections with. And many students from Chile who have come here for their degree have then gone back to work in Chile in that field. Um, and you know that connection is still very strong. That's great to hear. And it's always interesting to hear how students go after they finish their degree. So. Thank you so much for that. We don't seem to be getting any more questions coming in. So I'm happy to wrap it up there. So thank you both so much for um, the presentation today. It was really informative and comprehensive. And I hope the audience um, took advantage of this time to try and understand more about the Institute of Marine and, and Antarctic Studies. Um, so thank you so much for, for you both for joining um, and yeah. I will hand it over to you guys if you just wanted to say a quick note and then we'll close up the webinar. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mona. Um, thank you for coming to listen to us today. I hope you've at least been able to pick up some interesting things about Hobart and uh, Launceston and our institute. And I do encourage you to um, look at our University of Tasmania and the IMAS websites because there is a lot of information there that will really help you plan your studies here if you decided that you wanted to come and work here. So thanks again and uh, good luck. Thank you. Thanks guys.